you say, did you say this? Welcome everyone to New Covenant United Methodist Church, a place to call home. We are so glad you are worshiping with us this weekend. And I have a few announcements I want to bring to your attention. First of all, if you are interested in becoming a member of New Covenant, we have a new member class coming up. So if you could uh, go to our website, check through the weekly word, we have a registration there and we'll be happy to connect you with the new member class. Secondly, we have been working really hard to continue to provide some interesting studies and topics while we're under this pandemic. As you may know, we've had Don Piper doing a seven-week series. We had Pastor Jeff doing a four-week. And we will be finishing up John Ed Matheson this weekend. So what we're really excited to present is Dr. Bill Barnes, who is Pastor Harold's mentor and good friend. And he's going to give us a 12-week series on the Bible in 12 words. That'll be available beginning next weekend, Labor Day weekend. It'll be live and available for you. So we hope that you'll tune into that. Lastly, we will be regathering for worship on the weekend of the 12th and the 13th of September. Please watch your weekly word for more information, but registration will open on the Thursday before, and it will cut off Saturday at noon. You will need to register to be a part of in-person worship. Online worship, virtual worship will still continue to go on. So if you're not comfortable coming back yet, we hope that you will continue to watch us on virtually on either YouTube, Facebook, or through the website. There are many details involved in that, and we will be following CDC guidelines for in-person worship. So I hope that you will uh, make sure you register and you make sure that if you're not coming to in-person that you continue to watch virtually. We are so glad you're with us. Welcome, welcome. Now let's prepare as we, we get our hearts ready for worship.
shines your splendor each and every day. And though sometimes it's hard to see that you're with us, we know from your word that each day is a new day. That you're with us, you guide us, you protect us. You walk this journey with us. And no matter what we may be facing, we can look to you and we can say, blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter what the circumstance. Teach us how to depend and trust on your goodness. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, for your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. be your name when I'm found in the desert place the walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will
family, it's always great to come together in prayer. And the one thing we do know is that wherever the Spirit is, we will worship together in spirit and truth. So as we continue in our worship, let's bow our hearts before our great God. Almighty God, you are our creator, our redeemer, but you are our friend. And we are so grateful that we are yours. In a time when life does seem uncertain, we can claim the name of the Lord God Almighty, the Most High God, Yahweh, that there is nothing beyond your grasp. We praise you with everything we have. And we praise you not because just because who you are, but also because you love us. And you love us so deeply. God, we have so many things that are wrestling in our minds and our hearts. And we just want to lay them tonight at your feet for the racial unrest and injustice that has occurred this week in our country we cry out we cry out to you let there be peace where there seems to be none God for the damage that has happened and for the lives lost and the homes lost from Hurricane Laura, God, we cry out to you. We cry out. May you send your healing mercies and comfort to those who are standing without homes today. And God, we continue to lift this virus situation to you, this pandemic. God, we cry out for healing. We cry out for wholeness. We cry out for people's safety. Be with us, God, as we realize that there is so many things happening that cause pain and suffering. Be the God who heals. Be our God who comes in mightily and sends peace and love and healing. God, we claim these things tonight. We claim these things because we are your children. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ who you sent for every single being on this planet. It may be easy sometimes to say, well, God did not send them for this person or that person, but you sent Jesus for all people, all people. So we ask you tonight, we ask you to send your healing, your healing balm, your healing word. As we pray the prayer, that Jesus taught us to pray in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Ellen. So, uh, you know, each week we've been highlighting a different ministry, and this week we wanted to um, specifically hire, 
uh, highlight missions and outreach. By the way, Ellen just um, mentioned in her prayer about all the people who have been devastated by Hurricane Laura. And once again, next week, um, we always funnel all our donations through UMCOR, which is our connection to United Methodism. So if you'd like to make a donation, we'll let you know how to do that next week. And we hope you consider that because I know that there are a lot of people who are really broken. So this week, I'm very happy and pleased to be able to announce and introduce Janine Rogers. And Janine is our brand new um, director of missions and outreach here at New Covenant, and we're just thrilled to have Janine and want to introduce you, uh, introduce her to you all um, this evening. And so, uh, Janine, I know that you all, you have um, become, uh, uh, well, you've become a little bit more accustomed to what's happened in the life of our church after you made your rounds. And so tell us a little bit about, I think one of the places you had a chance to visit was um, the food pantry. So I think we wanted to highlight the food pantry this week. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Pastor Harold. The food pantry, since its inception in 2005, has distributed 3.2 million pounds of food. Uh, this year, they celebrate 15 years of service to this wonderful community. Not only um, have they distributed that much food over the inception, but th just this year alone, they've given out 173,000 pounds of food and served 2,070 families within this community. And not only this community, but they've also spread love to Lake Panasofsky and the Webster community. We are really blessed to have all of the wonderful volunteers who help us within this ministry, and we're uh, really happy to be able to spread love and food to families who are so much in need. Beautiful. Well, we're so grateful and we're honored to have you, Janine, to be a part of our leadership team. And I know that you've already you're just done a fantastic job and we're just so grateful to you. So thank you so much. Thank you. So what um, Janine shared with you all, once again, it's just another way um, that we continue to live in our vision of here at New Covenant to be the hands, feet, and voice of Jesus Christ. So I know that the, uh, Don and Marlene Huggins are always welcome to receive more and more donations. I know that we have a place out in front of our church, um, and we continue to receive those. So thank you so much for your continued support of that ministry and so many other ministries here at New Covenant United Methodist Church. So let us continue worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we continue to give to our Lord and also as we continue to praise and worship Him. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Jesus, only Jesus. You will command the highest praise. Yours is the name above all names. You stand alone. I stand amazed. Thank you so much, Sean. Praise team. Just gorgeous as always. And so once again, as Alan mentioned just a few minutes ago, we look forward to having uh, some of you back here at worship and uh, have uh, people in auditorium. And we're just going to have a, a glorious time as that comes to fruition in a week or so. So uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord again uh, this evening. And so we have um, we continue this sermon series on what Jesus meant. I picked up seven of the greatest sayings of Christ. And so Tonight, um, I have one um, actually from the Gospel of Matthew, the 19th chapter. And so this is what the, the phrase that we're focusing on. So if you wish to be perfect, Jesus says, go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. And, if you'll have, and then you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And then he goes on to say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone to, uh, who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So um, we're going to take this, these two uh, phrases today and break it all down. And so uh, that uh, story comes from Matthew, as I mentioned, the 19th chapter. So let me just read the whole story. And so we can try to break it down and make sense of what, 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 what Jesus meant. So on um, the 16th verse of uh, Matthew 19. So then uh, someone came to him and said, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And then he said to him, uh, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And then he said, well, which ones? And then Jesus says, well, you shall not murder. You shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't steal. You um, shouldn't bear false witness on your father and mother. And also, well, here's a good one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then the young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? And then Jesus said, well, if you wish to be perfect, then go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, well, he went away grieving for he had he had many, many possessions. Uh, this is the word of God for the people of God. Uh, thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. So let me begin with this this question. Um, the, this this phrase just jumped at me this week. He's, you know, I've heard and read this story many times. I've preached on this text many times. But the the, the question that came to my mind this week is, um, what do you lack? Uh, what do we lack? And, and I mean, is there something maybe missing in in your life? Uh, this week, true story, my, my granddaughter, Marley Ray, she's two and a half, and 
Boy, I tell you what, she has spiced up our lives this week. She is a spice girl. Um, uh, just uh, lit up our house, and she keeps uh, has kept me and Donna going for the last 48 hours, and um, never a dull moment, I'm just telling you. So uh, I had told um, her mother uh, many, many years ago that I said, Olivia, I hope that someday you have a daughter, and I, gu- I guarantee you, if you have a daughter, she's going to be just like you. And my prophecy, I just want you to know, has come to fruition because Marley is just like her mother. Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, their, their temperament, the way that they have kind of a strong will about them. And so I remember um, Olivia coming to me and her mother. I think um, maybe she was in first or second grade. It has to do with what you're lacking something. She um, told me and her mother that she had to have um, a pair of boots. They were, they were black. They came up high on her legs. They were like go-go boots, um, you know, from 1970s. They were back into style. And so she, well, well they were to die for. She, she had to have them. Now, I remember that because I remember it was a big deal in our house. I mean, I wasn't making a lot of money, and I remember they were fairly expensive, but she kept on and on and on, persuasive. Finally wore down her, her mother and I, and we, we got her the boots. They were to die for. As I recall, and this is a true story, I think she wore them one time. And for the life of me, to this day, I have no idea why she had to have them. But it's like one of those things when you finally, you have to have something, then you get it. And then when you realize maybe it really isn't that big of a deal, she, well, they were to die for. Let me ask you, what is it in your life that maybe uh, there's a difference between what you want and maybe what you need. When I think about my life, and as I was doing my sermon preparation about asking my, I knew I was going to ask this question of y'all, what is that I lack? See, the, what I lacked at the age of 17 is very different from my perception about life at the age of 57 about what I lack. Now, when I was at 17, uh, I mean, I was uh, young, I was naive, I, I was uh, determined I was, uh, I had a, a will about me, um, I had a vision, um, I had a dream at the age of 17. And, and, but my, the things that I, I lacked at the age of 17 were, well, I lacked, um, I, liked, I lacked a higher education, I lacked having a wife, I lacked having children, I lacked having grandchildren, I lacked having a career. By the way, I had no idea what I was go- supposed to do at the age of 17, uh, no clue, zero. I, I was just right field. Uh, I, I lacked uh, money, I, I lacked a home, you know, all these things um, in my life. Um, I lacked a lot. But now, I did have some things. I mean, like, you know, I had a, a, I had a roof over my head. I had two parents that loved me unconditionally. I, I, have a, I had a sister. Um, I, I had, um, you know, I, I was in high school. I, I had a edu- somewhat of an education. I, I even had Converse All-Star shoes. I, I was the envy of the school. I mean, I, I, had, I had almost, I thought I had it all, right? Um, but I still lacked a lot. What I, I lack today is very different from what maybe I, I lacked, you know, when I was 17. I mean, there is a difference between age 17 and 57 and 87. So the question is, first, what is it we, what we lack? What do you lack? Uh, um, I, I wrote down this question for us to ponder tonight, and this really kind of gets to the real point. You ready for this? Here it is. Finish this sentence, and I think we actually have this on the screen. I have everything I ever wanted except, how would you um, answer that question? I have everything in my life um, except what? I, I made a list this week because um, I knew I was going to be preaching on this text. So um, I, I, I had this, this, you know, John Wesley, the founder of Methodist Church, he had this, this, this quote he would ask over his his. his uh, follower, fellow f- followers of Methodism, the followers of Christ. How is it with your soul? And, and so let me ask, if, um, if I have everything I ever wanted except, do I have peace? I mean, do I have that peace that goes beyond all understanding, uh, as Paul put it? Do I have patience? I mean, um, I, I was thinking this last week. Um, Ann Foothill and I were interviewing a candidate f- uh, for a job recently, and 
and we asked the, this particular person about how would you deal with conflict resolution? And um, this particular person says, well, you know, it's, um, I just have a hard time with stupid. And, and, you know, we, I thought that was actually a pretty powerful quote because sometimes we just lack patience when we are just dealing with stupid stuff. Um, do you lack security? I mean, when you think about it, I, I, you know, I, I just want to know that I have enough to get me to the finish line financially. Do I lack assurance like that, I, you know, I'm going to go to heaven, um, that, I'm, you know, I, I'm just, Lord, just can you just give me a sign? Can maybe you give me a lightning bolt? Can you give me some kind of tangible thing? And I have had this conversation with many, many people who are just kind of waffling, trying to figure out, you know, am I going to go to heaven? I'm not going to go to heaven. I want to be assurance. I mean, don't we all want to get to that place What I talked about in my sermon a couple of weeks ago when my, one of my friends who was actually, he's got cancer and says, you know, Harold, I'm, I'm good. And when he said that to me over lunch, I, I knew that he had that assurance. Um, how about forgiveness? I mean, the idea of, I, I can't forgive my, uh, Harold, I have a hard time forgiving myself for some of these things in my life that I've done. I don't know if God can possibly forgive me. Um, or, or maybe companionship. You know, my, my mother, I, I love my mother. I adore my mother. I'm grateful for my mother. But, you know, my, at times I know that my mother is lonely. She was married to my father for almost 60 years. And there are times in which she, there's some sense of void in her life. And I, I'm, my, my mother is one of hundreds and hundreds of people that I've come in contact with the last nine years of being your senior pastor that feel as if there's something lacking, lacking happiness, lacking pain-free life, lacking maybe something in your health. Finish this sentence. I have everything I've ever wanted except, how would you finish that? Uh, so we have this great text this night. I, I love this text. Um, the rich young ruler. Uh, you know, it kind of remind me of when I was reading this. I, I thought, okay, what would be kind of a contemporary image of someone who kind of would maybe could solidify the rich young ruler? And um, I've got a picture of, uh, well, can you put that picture of JFK Jr.? So to, to me, I, I thought of JFK Jr. And when I thought about the rich young ruler. I mean, and what we find here is that this story is actually in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we know it's an important story. We also know that Matthew gives us this detail that he was young. There's a reason for that. I'll tell you in just a second. And then Luke gives us this detail that he was a ruler. So, hey, you got all three. You put them all together. We've got the story that we know as the rich young ruler. We also know, as I mentioned, Matthew is writing to a specific audience. And the reason why most scholars believe that they put Matthew put that detail in about emphasizing that he was young is because he wanted to make sure that he was reaching a specific target audience of younger, maybe professional or affluent people that he was trying to attract to the church. I, and so I, that makes sense to me because, you know, sometimes when you link, think about when we're thinking about doing ministry, aren't we trying to be very intentional when we have sometimes we at New Covenant, we, you know, we have our target audience. We're, we're targeting, trying to reach as many people as we possibly can. But Matthew is laser focused as he tells this story, a rich, young ruler. And, and I, I will tell you this. Well, you got to know your audience when you're, when you're speaking. I mean, the way that I might deliver this message tonight may be a totally different if I was doing a confirmation class. If I was telling this story to a bunch of 12-year-olds, is a little bit different from telling the story to a bunch of people who may be more, uh, a little, uh, maybe a little bit older. So you got to know your audience. The detail in this story tonight is what I think is also very interesting is that the, as Matthew sp uh, spins this story, um, he, refer he says that the rich young ruler um, refers to Jesus as teacher. Now, that's important. You may miss that detail. And the reason why that's important is because um, most people who were, well, if you were an insider, you didn't refer to Jesus as the teacher. You would refer to him as Lord. But he didn't refer to him as Lord. He referred to him, and according to Gospel of Matthew, he says, teacher. Which means, oh man, here's a thought. That means that he's an outsider. 
Um, because if he was an insider, then means that he would be referring to Jesus as Lord. But if you're an outsider, he would refer to Jesus as, as teacher. And then I started thinking, I mean, isn't it Jesus' goal for all of us? I mean, to make people who are maybe are on the outside, to make them to feel as if that they're welcome to the inside. Uh, I, I, I had this image this week. Um, as a matter of fact, I've got this uh, picture of this field. And it has all these circles on it. And it has to do with social distance. I, I don't have any idea with that. It's in park somewhere here in America. And so you could see all the people who were in this little, their little circle. They were in their little zones. And I thought this is a beautiful example of how Jesus is trying to get the outsiders of his circle inside the realm of his circle. And he is always calling people into his circle. He wants us to be in his circle he desires us to be in a circle. He died for us. You know what to die for. Jesus died for us in order for us to be in his circle. Um, an outsider becoming an insider. I remember, you know, listen, let me tell you something. I, I went to a few years ago, I went to visit Cameron at the, uh, over here at the high school. And um, I, I just brought back memories. Me and his brothers went to visit him for lunch. And I noticed the dynamics of, of, of cafeteria lunchtime at the high school. And, and so, what you know, at the Villages High School, it's no different from any high school probably in America. You know, you have certain people who seem to gravitate, and they all go to the exact same table, and they sit with the exact same people every single week. You got the athletic people over here. You got the band people over here. You got these other people over here. They just seem to gravitate each other. And they're all kind of doing their own only holy huddles, and that's exactly what I observed. And I remember true story when I was in college. And you know what's interesting? You think that maybe it would get a little bit better when you go to college. No, 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 no. When we went and when I was at Florida Southern College, it was exactly the same thing. You had the athletic people over here, but then you get into fraternities and sororities. And so the fraternities would all sit at one table, and the certain sororities would sit in all the same all the same tables, and they all would sit at the exact same tables. Except if you're independent like me, we had one little table off in the corner. It was round. My friend Van um, uh, one day uh, saw um, this other young man. He was a freshman in college. Um, it, it, it looked, his name was Cal. And what's interesting about Cal is Cal was an outsider. He didn't have anybody. He was sitting at the table all by himself. And my friend Van was, I mean, he got Jesus. Van was very devout in his faith. I love what I love about Van is he just loved the Lord. And so what he did was Van was like he would go find the puppy dog. So he found the puppy dog. His name was Cal. There's Cal sitting in the corner all by himself in that little round table. He's not a part of fraternity. He's not a part of a sorority. He's not a part of anything. He's all by himself. So Cal, Van goes and sits down and says, hey, do you mind if I sit down here? And then Cal said, well, sure, you can sit down here. And you know what's interesting? From that conversation, all of a sudden, Cal was brought into another fold of all these other people, other friends who all, and by the way, they're still friends 40 years later. All began from one little conversation. Do you mind if I sit down? So, so what's interesting is that Jesus is always trying to get the people from the outside coming to the inside. Jesus asked, uh, well, the, the rich young ruler says, teacher, what does I have to do? Uh, that's a great phrase, isn't it? I mean, there, that's a loaded that's a loaded phrase in the text. What is it I have to do? Oh, I mean, here's a thought. Uh, the rich young ruler, he's a doer. He's got to achieve something. Hey, and he thinks all I got to do is I've got this. I mean, he's rich. He's uh, wealth. I mean, he's wealthy. He's got everything he could ever imagine. But he lacks, wait a minute, he lacks something. If I, if I can just get a hold of this eternal life thing, man, I've got, I've got it all. Uh, rich. Young, ruler, powerful, eternal life. What is it I have to do? Can you just give me one more command, uh, one more detail, and then I, I got it. Um, it's like, it's like you've, you've, you've spent all this time putting together the puzzles, the pie, pieces of the puzzle. It, it would be as if the, you spent months putting together a jigsaw puzzle, and you get down to the last piece, and you can't find it. Oh my God! Where is the last? Where's the lost piece? I I can't I can't imagine having all this perfectly together. 
but I'm missing the one last piece of the puzzle. The rich wrangler says, hey, listen, I, I'm missing the last piece of the puzzle. I've got everything except this last piece. So it was interesting is that his question, what is it I have to do, really is, well, it's kind of a loaded question because he thinks he has, well, he could achieve salvation. Well, listen, you can't achieve salvation. It didn't work that way. And that's the point. Jesus, is he's, he's trying to achieve what's impossible. You can't achieve, but what, what Jesus is, but with, with God, all things are possible, but you can't achieve, you can't achieve salvation. So he comes seeking happiness, satisfaction, a peace with God. But the, the way he phrases the question betrays his request. And, and he, he turns it into some kind of action, some kind of rule, some kind of regulation, some kind of policy. What is it I have to do, Jesus, to have eternal life? Here's a thought. It's, it's almost like he's got a credit balance sheet uh, with God. He, and, and, and he's got to work his way in order to have. And he real, he, what he doesn't understand is that he's always going to lose when it comes to that kind of theology. What does I have to do to inherit eternal life? Can you imagine being on a losing team and always losing? I mean, who wants that? But he's thinking, listen, if I just can do one more thing, give me the last piece of puzzle, give me one command, Jesus, then I got it. I mean, I went back and looked about the uh, losing records. I mean, college football, Northwestern lost 34 games in a row. The NBA Cavs lost 27 games in a row. The NFL Buccaneers lost 26 games in a row. Division three men's basketball at Caltech Beavers lost 207 games in a row. Can you imagine being a part of that, that team? 207 games, I mean, constantly losing, losing, losing. And, and so when it comes to the idea the, of credit balance sheet, we're all going to lose because we can't achieve salvation. It didn't work that way. That's why we need grace. We need mercy. We need the hope of Christ. Jesus is gathering us all together to be in his circle. Um, I, I thought of this, I mean, uh, Paul nails this. You ready for this? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. We would never win if Jesus is keeping the score. Think about that. We wouldn't. And so what's powerful is the reality is that we can't ever be good enough. We can't ever can't do enough to be good enough. We can't give enough to be good enough. If we went into that theology, we would call that in the church, we, let me give you a big word, we call that works righteousness, and it doesn't work that way. We are dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ. We're dependent upon the salvation of Jesus Christ. We're dependent upon his forgiveness and grace upon Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying to this guy, let me take you by the hand. Come and follow me, and I'll show you the way towards eternal life. Yeah, I, I, I had this vision in my head this week of this song. Maybe you know the words. It's called Precious Lord. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm alone. Through the storms, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He, he's trying to lead this guy in the right direction. So Jesus is saying, uh, um, the rich friend, what does I have to do? He's a doer, an achiever. What does I have to do to have everlasting life? And, and, and so Jesus basically responds back to him, well, you need to keep the commandments. Now, here's a great detail. Let me just teach for a second. And the guy says, yes, I, I have done that. And he says, which ones? And Jesus rattles off, he doesn't rattle off the first five of the Ten Commandments. He rattles off the last five of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, you know, and, and then thou, thou, shalt not, thou shalt take care of your mother and father. Now listen, what's very powerful all of that, what does that tell us about the story? That's extremely important because there are basically two ways to look at the Ten Commandments. The first five 
of the Ten Commandments have everything to do with duty and obligation to our Heavenly Father, to God Almighty. He's got that. But what he's missing and what he's lacking is the back five of the Ten Commandments. And the back five that Jesus rattles off has everything to do with personal relationships with other people. Now, there's a clue. I mean, it's almost like, you know, you go and you do, if you remember taking algebra and, and, you know, if you had an algebra teacher that maybe would extend you a little grace so you could do an algebra problem and maybe you get, well, you get halfway through the problem and you, well, you miss a negative and you maybe miss a parentheses and it just messes up the whole problem. So you, you it, and then he or she looks at it and sees that you've done all your work, but you've got the wrong answer at the bottom, but he or she sees that you've made a good effort that he or she sees that you're on the right track, but they only give you half credit. And, and so here's what's going on with this guy. He's got the first part of the equation, the algebra equation, uh, algebra equation all together, but he's missing the back end. And he's got this duty thing down, policies, procedures, rules, regulations, the whole idea about keeping a ground balance sheet with God, check, check, check. He's got all that covered. He's a rich young ruler. He's a smart guy, but something about his relationship with other people is ain't right. And Jesus points that out. That's the reason why he picks out the back five of the, five of the Ten Commandments. By the way, here's just another thought. Don't miss the detail. Why does Jesus put those five out of order? He does. Do you realize that he, he puts the honor of your mother and father and makes that fifth? The reason why most scholars believe he'd put that last is to bring emphasis. In other words, maybe this rich young ruler, you know, he's made a lot of money in the stock market. Maybe the reason why Jesus put that last it has not only with his relationship with other people, but maybe it has everything to do with his own relationship with his mother and father. He's supposed to be honor them because, well, once again, somehow he has missed the mark about relationships, even with his mother and father. There's a thought. So I, I was thinking this last week. When it comes to how is it your how is your attitude with other people? How is my attitude with other people? I mean, by the way, J Jesus says here he gets to all this, and he also says, well, you know, you're supposed to not steal, uh, not commit adultery, not fear false witness, honor your mother and father, and then he also oh, man, here's another one: you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's a thought. How are we doing with that? Think about that. A true story. I, I've got a picture of my friend Lorraine. I think I'm going to put her up on the screen. Here, here's my friend Lorraine Harris. Uh, um, Lorraine and Lamont are, are two of uh, my dearest friends. Matter of fact, um, several years ago, Lorraine and Lamont basically have taken my five children under the wing, and they have become their godparents. Um, uh, Don and I didn't have godparents when we baptized kids, but Lorraine and Lamont have basically taken our five children under the wing, and they said, Harold, we want to be godparents to your children. And I said, God bless you. That is wonderful. They have been to the birthdays. They've been to uh, uh, the baptisms. They've been to uh, graduations for my kids over the last nine years. They're just amazing people. The other day, uh, Lorraine, true story, she was over at Wildwood High, Middle High School, and she's a mentor. And, and, and she told me the story, and I asked permission to actually share this. And she said, you know what, uh, Lamont was doing his mentoring, but I had a few minutes before uh, my, my child was going to come out. She says, well, I want to go get my steps in. I want to be able to walk. So she walked out, and she saw uh, a lady who happened to be white. Um, she said hello to her, but she didn't respond. And then she went on out, and she was walking out in front of the Wildwood Middle School and trying to get her steps in, just kind of passing time uh, to get her exercise in. The next thing you know is the police come out and question her because someone had called in to the school saying that there is a suspicious black lady out walking in front of the school. Wow. That's pretty amazing. And what's even amazing is that Lorraine and Lamont, they've been mentors for the last year or two. So the police came out and questioned her about why she was out walking in front of the school, what she was doing there. And she says, I'm a mentor for these kids. And here's my kid. 
I, I, I just, this is part of the issue that we continue to face in our American culture today. It's not good. And so Jesus says, hey, listen, all right, uh, it gets to the rich young ruler. Uh, uh, keep the command. Oh, okay, I, I've done those. But what about your relationship with those? And by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. I, I thought about this this last week. You know, Jesus told, um, as he tells this story, it has such great value for people, for all of us. I, I love this quote from William Barclay who said this. He says, you know, if a person looks on their possessions as given to them for nothing but their own comfort and convenience, they are a chain which must be broken. If they look on their possessions as a means to helping others, they are their crown. There's a difference between chains and crowns and evaluating people for who they are. I was thinking this once again this last week. I mean, have you ever just kind of felt maybe a little bit selfish? I mean, that, that's the point here. Jesus is making a point about this rich young ruler when he goes and says, so listen, you, you think you've got it all and you've got all the answers and you lack something. And what you lack ultimately has everything to do with relationships. And you're not getting those right. And so then I started thinking about how do we discern that for our own lives? I mean, is there something missing in you? Is there something lacking in me? I mean, the idea of not being judgmental. I've talked about that. Judge not lest you be judged. Or the idea of not being self-serving. Hey, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or the idea of not being prideful. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus said that. These are the greatest sayings of Jesus. And so when we take them to the heart, are we lacking these things? Are we missing the mark on these things? Is there something that we truly need in our life? And what, what's interesting about, is once again, I, I, let me just teach for a second. You ready for this? Don't miss the detail. And the detail is always there. And so Jesus has this conversation um, with the rich, young ruler. Put it all together. What is it I need to do to inherit or to have eternal life? Two of the most important words in the whole story. Here's the detail. The word eternal life here is the, the great truth of the story is the definition of eternal life is the, is the life such as God himself. It doesn't mean heaven, eternal life, but it has everything to do with eternal life, has everything to do with basically taking on the characteristics of Almighty God. That's what it means can I, when I inherit eternal life. Can I inherit those good qualities, those excellent qualities of Almighty God? That's what eternal life means in this story. So there's a difference between eternal life that we normally, when we read this text, we think, okay, I'm th he's thinking about heaven, I'm thinking about being with Jesus or being with Almighty God in heaven. No, no, no. When he talks about eternal life here, everything to do with eternal life here is, can I take on those characteristics of Almighty God and implement them in life? And so listen, what do we know about God? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I have amen on that? So when I think about that, God is a giver and God is one who loves us for God so loved the world. And so when we think about what we're supposed to take on about eternal life in this context has everything to do with taking on the characteristics of Almighty God. So if we want to find eternal life, what Jesus meant here in this story is that you're going to have to find eternal life and the role, not, you're not going to find it in rules and regulations. You're not going to find it in keeping score. Nope, doesn't work that way. But we're dependent upon salvation through Jesus Christ. We find it through his amazing grace. We find it by coming and be a part of his inner circle. We find it how ultimately, how we try, ultimately hold true to the, being and loving our neighbor as ourself. That's what Jesus meant. Jesus said this to the guy. He says, hey, listen, if you want to be made perfect. Now, oh, wait a minute. There's another one of those details, not only about eternal life, which means not, not eternal life as in living everlasting life, but taking on the qualities of God. But he says, do you want to be, hey, what, if you really want to be made perfect. Now, back then, there's two roles of discipleship, two levels. 
ordinary or perfect. Ordinary discipleship. And listen, when Jesus talks about selling all your possessions, he's not talking about the average person here. I mean, many people be devoted. And, and uh, when we think about being devoted to Almighty God and we can have good characteristics and we're following God, it doesn't necessarily mean for all of us that we have to go sell our possessions, give it all to the poor. That's not exactly what Jesus is saying. The reason why this Jesus points out about being perfect is has to do with back then in first century AD, you could go and be a part of a religious sect and the religious group would take care of you and you could give all your money away to the poor. It reminds me of kind of like Mother Teresa. You know, she was a nun. Uh, she, the, the, the Catholic Church, I suppose, took care of her um, as far as any, any, any needs that she had, the basic staples of life. She took, at, at the age of 21, she devoted herself completely to, to Jesus Christ and living this life of poverty amongst the poorest of the poor. By the way, she won a Nobel Peace Prize. The money that she, when she won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, she said, I don't want it. Give it all away to the poor. Can you imagine that? And they want to throw a banquet for her. She says, I don't, I'm not going to the banquet. Don't even think about giving me a banquet. Give the money to the poor. So, so the idea here, what Jesus is talking about, is, is listen, if you really want to be made perfect, go and sell all your, all your possessions and allow this religious order to take care of you. And then you really, well, then you'll find eternal life. You'll find those characteristics of God that you really are searching. You will finally find that missing piece of the puzzle. Kind of remind me of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. I love that story. Uh, he would be one of these persons that would be considered like perfect. Matter of fact, I think I got a picture of St. Francis of Assisi. There he is. And, and so what's amazing about St. Francis of Assisi, do you realize how wealthy, how powerful he was? His dad owned a, a whole fleet of merchant ships. And I think he was born about 1100, 1200 uh, AD. And, and so he finally had this divine revelation from Almighty God that God was revealing something to him. And it had nothing to do with wealth, had nothing to do with power. And he was young. And he literally goes into the middle of the market square and he takes all his clothes off and hands his clothes to his dad. He says, I give everything that I have back to you. And his father basically disemboweled him and he went on and become St. Saint, Saint Francis of Assisi because he decided that he was going to give everything away to the glory of God. Now, listen, not everybody's called to do that. Matter of fact, if you look at this gospels, Jesus had disciples who followed him, but he never told he never told Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all his disciples. He never told them that they had to sell their possessions and come follow. They wouldn't follow him. He didn't tell me had to go to, to follow to, uh, to give up their uh, all their life uh, as far as their possessions. Uh, uh, Nicodemus was a wealthy man. Um, Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. Uh, Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. But what we find in the story is it seems to me that Jesus is laser focused on this particular individual because somehow he's missing the piece of the puzzle that he really is. He doesn't really want to buy into. He doesn't want to go there. And yet Jesus knows his audience. He knows specifically what this guy is really all about. He's rich. He's young. He's powerful. And yet Jesus breaks it all down for him. I think it's really powerful when I think about this because I think, you know, what is it we all lack? What does this guy lack? Jesus says, hey, listen, he want to be made perfect. Listen, go and sell it all. Come, follow me. And, and so I was thinking about this, you know, has ever Jesus ever told you what you lacked? I mean, have you, do you feel maybe you lack patience, humility, care, sensitivity? I mean, there have been times my wife has reminded me, Harold, Harold, Harold. What are you doing? You're just too hard. You've got to let it go. You've got to rise above. And I'd say to her, as I shared last week, you know, honey, I don't want to rise above. What is it you lack? Harold, Harold, Harold. What is it you lack? Uh, so I was thinking about this. What I, I thought this was very powerful. And, and here's the interesting thought. When Jesus finally lays it all out, you ready? The Bible says he went away sad. It's almost the opposite. I mean, once upon a time, Jesus told this parable. This guy uh, he finds out there's a treasure in the field. And so he sells everything he has to be able to buy the property so he could have the treasure, which is like the kingdom of God. And the Bible says he rejoiced because he finally had what he wanted. You see the opposite? One is rejoicing and one goes away sad. And what I thought about this is very powerful, this imagery. Because Jesus says, hey, listen, go, it's all you have. 
If you want to be made perfect, come follow me. And the Bible says he went away sad, which means he had to go away. It means he had to turn his back on Jesus Christ. Now, there's a thought. Have you ever felt like maybe you've turned your back on Christ? So here's a thought. If you could have a pile of cash or spend the next year of your life walking and learning from Jesus, which would you choose from? So here's the last little part of my story today, my, my message. I got a picture of the camel. Um, there's a picture of me riding a camel. And so what is this whole thing about Jesus talking about the camel? I, I, this is actually very profound. Um, uh, it's easier for a, a, a rich, uh, the idea of uh, for a rich man uh, not be able to go to heaven than it is well, ultimately for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, a camel, go, it's impossible. You can't put a camel through the eye of the needle. Well, what's interesting, the word camel and the Greek is one letter off from the word, here's a thought, from the word rope. And the rope specifically is uh, connected to hold. How do you hold a ship anchored to a dock? And what's very powerful is it doesn't really matter. The point is a camel can't go through an eye of a needle or maybe a rope that would be holding a ship go through an eye of a needle. It literally is impossible for that to even imagine. It, it doesn't matter if it was he literally meant a camel or he meant a rope. But ultimately, it's impossible for us to be able to think about. And so when you think about this story today, is it's very, very powerful because Jesus is getting at this guy as he says, listen, what you have, you are missing the mark. You have met, go sell all that you have and be able to come and follow me and you'll find peace and you'll find eternal life. You'll find what you're truly looking for so matthew is this gospel he asked him what he still lacks something is missing in his life there's something missing maybe in your life what do you lack patience kindness compassion christ what do you lack I, so I, I close with this thought i mean didn't jesus just say hey listen can't you just take my hand and follow me Please just come. Can you take my hand? Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I'm tired. I'm weak. I'm alone. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me home. Lord Jesus, my prayer for us as a congregation that you continue to be our guiding light, to be our inspiration. And Lord, we can have everything, and yet we can have absolutely nothing without you. Uh, forgive us, Lord, when we have been way too sure of ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, when we have tried to work our way towards you. And Lord, let us continue to be mindful that the only way is through you. So, Lord, let us find ourselves at your feet, asking for mercy, for forgiveness, and asking for your eternal peace in our souls. And my prayer tonight, Lord, if there's anybody that's never taken your hand, that they can do that right now, that you're willing to take their hand, and that we will all come and follow you because we want to be a part of your circle of love, hope, and peace. In Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen.
defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. And you lift us up on our wings like eagles. Strength for us is the way to find the Lord. We will wait. Thank you so much for worshiping with us tonight. And remember that the most important thing is that you talk about to die for. Jesus died for you and for me. God bless you. And we'll see you again soon. Have a great week.